I'm going to get the whole thing this time. Welcome everyone to our afternoon on the East Coast session, searching for signatures of life and technology on exoplanets. Um, this is going to be a somewhat informal session. So our panelists will introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about what they do and the research that is going on in their groups and it's exciting to them. And then we're going to open the table to questions from all of you. If you have a question, you're welcome to wave at us or raise your hand or just start talking. We'd love it if you would turn on your camera so that they can see your face and feel like they're talking to you. It's wonderful. Um, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our panelists. If you have a question at any time or a technical issue, just drop it into the chat and we'll get right back to you. I'm gonna stop sharing and we can ask Natalie to start. Hello, everybody. I see some familiar names here in the participants list. It's nice to see you. Uh, I'm Natalie Battaglia. I'm a professor of astrophysics and director of astrobiology at UC Santa Cruz. I study exoplanets, their detection, their characterization, and their demographics. And I'm leading a program that's going to take the first, some of the first exoplanet observations with the James Webb Space Telescope. We're really looking forward to that and expect our data to come down in July. Um, we're really interested in understanding what the real estate for life is out in the galaxy. Um, Kepler discovered a huge diversity of exoplanets. We don't understand that diversity. We don't understand the physical processes that led to that diversity. And there are going to be implications for the propensity for life. So that's what we're trying to understand. Thanks, Natalie. Ravi, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Oh, yes. Um... Thank you, Liza, and uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Ravi Koporapu. Uh, I'm a planetary scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I uh, study the climates and habitability of exoplanets uh, with the hope of uh, one day, you know, hopefully discovering biosignatures and technosignatures on other worlds. Uh, and I am a lead for uh, a Cellus Exoplanet uh, Environment Collaboration, a, a group here at NASA Goddard that works on uh, various aspects of studying exoplanets and their formation, atmospheres, and characterization. And uh, I'm quite excited uh, for the future of exoplanets. We are living in the golden era right now. We may have, uh, in our lifetime, potentially may be able to answer one of the oldest questions we have been asking. And this is probably the time we would be, could be doing it. Ravi Owen. Uh, so, hi, everybody. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, my name is Owen Lemer, and I'm a planetary scientist at the NASA Ames Research Center in California. And I study the evolution of planets like Earth or habitable worlds in general. And I, I sort of bridge the gap between measurements in the lab and in the field and simulations of planets, and then try and tie that into some of the observations coming in from telescopes. So I'm very excited for, for you know, the results that hopefully Natalie's team will get and others with James Webb and we build that into our models and then try and relate that back to what we see in the lab and in the, the field what we collect on earth. So a lot of modeling work. Everyone, I see Alex is popping in. Do you have a question, Alex? I do. Hi, Natalie. Uh, Hi. We want to hear more about what you're going to be looking at with James Webb. Um, <laughs> targets, you said data would be coming back in July. What does that mean for like when you'll be able to have results for us? Tell us more. Uh, let's see, where to start? So um, we're, we're going to be observing some benchmark exoplanets that have been observed previously with Hubble, for example. So we've detected some molecular abundances already. So we'll have that nice dramatic before and after, you know, Webb versus Hubble, which was something that we did with Kepler too, which is always super fun. What did we learn with Hubble? What did we deduce about the atmosphere and does that play forward now that we have this much broader spectral coverage and sensitivity that Webb is going to give us will be some of the first questions. We expect to receive the data, analyze it immediately. It'll take us about two weeks to push that data through the pipeline. The data trickles in over the month of July, our first data set at least. Some of it will extend into August. It'll take about two weeks to push that data through a pipeline that's already been developed and is now just being tweaked and finessed. There will be surprises, of course. Things might break. 
we'll need to modify the code. So, you know, it could delay a few, another couple weeks or so, but we wanna push that very first look out almost immediately. So by the end of the summer, we expect to be releasing that first look of the data and to be able to identify certain molecular species that, that have been detected. Anyone wanna follow up thoughts from, I know, Ravi knows a little bit about space telescope, thoughts about what you might be able to see of techno signatures and things you're looking for. Um, so we uh, we have uh, some programs. So we uh, we are part of a collaboration called CHAMPS, the Consortium for Habitable uh, M Dwarf uh, Planet, that studying uh, atmospheres of M -dwarf planets around M Dwarfs, which are cool stars, stars that are cooler than the sun. And so we have some uh, uh, observation time on that. Uh, and we are hoping that uh, to observe some of these exoplanets. And we are not going to look for any particular uh, uh, techno signatures or biosignatures on this ones because uh, some of these plants are a little bit warmer than we, uh, uh, what we are uh, thinking about. Uh, however, there was a paper that we uh, published last month on uh, what if there is a technological civilization on uh, TRAPPIST 1E, one of the most uh, uh, important targets for James Webb. Uh, and um, the goal was to see if James Webb can e even detect any of these uh, technological signatures. One of them signatures that we were trying to look for are CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons, right? That we uh, humans, it's an indication of industrialized civilization. And so uh, the, the point there was to uh, see whether we have the technological capability to see any kind of techno signatures right now with the current technology, rather than uh, uh, saying that, okay, it might exist on them. So we found that, you know, with some amount of uh, 100 hours of James Webb uh, in transit time, uh, there might be a chance if it exists that, you know, some CFCs can be discovered uh, with a decent signal to noise ratio on Travis 1E. So is that the first thing you're going to be looking for when we get data from? <laughs> so we, we don't have to look separately for these things. They If they show up in the data, they, they will be there. Like, I mean, as I just mentioned, these are not separate tools or techniques that we will have to use to discover these techno signatures. Our goal was to see with existing instruments and the existing methods, can we just look for the things that uh, may indicate some uh, activity of industrialized civilizations? And so uh, is, if it exists, it's there, then you know, if we cannot explain uh, some things, then we will have to think about what kind of anomalies that we want to look for in the data. And that could point out to some of the things I was talking about. So, so Alexandra, so just to give you kind of a big picture overview of what Web is gonna do in like year one, maybe extending into year two, it's going to be observing 76 exoplanets, like right, right at the beginning. I mean, for first year, right? 76, 37 of those um, are targets that have been previously observed by other space-based observatories like Hubble or Spitzer. 39 of them are brand new that we've never looked at before. And so these 76 planets are distributed in radius, let's say planet radius, about equally between small planets, smaller than about 70% larger than Earth or, or smaller, another 25-ish percent, I have the numbers exactly, 26% in the super Earth sub-Neptune regime. 1.7 to 4 Earth radius, which is Neptune sized. And then another third, about 37% actually, that are the giant planets. So roughly well distributed across the size um, spectrum. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different science that's going to be done in those first years, but I think right out the gate, at least for the small planets, all we wanna know is do these planets have atmospheres or not? right? Especially for TRAPPIST, which uh, TRAPPIST-1 is one of these very compelling systems that has three planets in the habitable zone um, that people are very anxious to study. It actually got 11% of the total exoplanet observing time is going to be devoted just to TRAPPIST. That's like 10 times more than any of the other planets on average. So um, yeah, but just initially, the, the very first questions are just going to be, do these planets have atmospheres?
question, Leo. I see you. Oh, uh, sorry. I no. I'm I'm, I'm just, fine. I'm just uh, I'm just lurking Rick. here. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Um, what what other techno signatures other than CFCs might we be looking for? Okay, so there are with 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 this in, uh, James Webb or with any instrument do you do you mean so with any instrument? Um, uh, so there kind are... of in general, what 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 could we find? What is speculative? What would be a, a smoking gun? Uh, so there, no one signal is a smoking gun. Okay, so no one signature is a smoking gun because it could be produced by some other means, by geological processes or you know some other processes that we. Uh, we might be not sure about. Uh, so there should be a combination of such uh, uh, gas species that we would be, we should be able to look for. Uh, so to answer your question directly, how, what, what other ones are there? There is, there was another paper that we published last year on um, how uh, nitrogen dioxide pollution could uh, potentially be used as a, a signature of uh, an industrialized uh, civilization because um, we on, on Earth, much of the nitrogen dioxide is being produced by um, vehicle emissions or uh, you know power plants that are burning fossil fuels. And uh, the amount of uh, the nitrogen dioxide produced by anthropogenic sources is about three times more than the biogenic or non-biogenic, like lightning, you know, or biology. So we produce more of that pollution than anything else. And so what we, when, when the first, um, when we uh, entered into the COVID pandemic uh, back in 2020, uh, there was a data that was published uh, uh, that looked at the amount of uh, change in the nitrogen dioxide in the earth's atmosphere when uh, lockdown started and before that. Uh, and we saw, uh, we, we noticed that, you know, there was a, a decrease in the amount of emissions because of the lockdowns, because of the pandemic. And uh, we, we wanted to see if that would be an indication of how we could, uh, if you can detect earth at you know, some distance away with this kind of uh, uh, industrialized pollution uh, species gas. And we found that uh, with, uh, with an, you know future uh, uh, you know, uh, a mission uh, that could directly image uh, exoplanets. Uh, there might be a possibility of finding uh, nitrogen dioxide pollution on some of the Earth-like planets in within about 10 light years or so, 10 parsecs or so. Any more questions from the audience? I guess maybe, maybe to sort of try to connect those two a bit more, um, this question about kind of what species, what molecules we might detect um, in atmospheres of some of these exoplanets. And again, sorry to be obsessed about JWST, but since we're about to go there, um, I'm really trying to get my brain prepped for when we get those first papers coming out, like we observed exoplanet X and we determined, you know, species, you know, Y and Z are present, how to sort of go about thinking about what that means for, you know, processes on the surface, like whether, you know, these things are coming from geology, whether they're coming from life. Are there particular types of molecules or species that James Webb is particularly well suited to detect that we haven't been able to detect from the ground on some of these planets? And how should we sort of prep our brains and thinking about when we hear that this exoplanet has this in its atmosphere, what does that mean holistically? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, keep in mind that Hubble looked at a very narrow wavelength range, like, like one to 1.5 microns, and the primary features there are water. So we make inferences, we do models based on those water features, and we infer what might be the carbon abundance, for example, without having any molecules that actually contain carbon. So, so finally, we are going to be observing in a wavelength range from one to 10 microns, you know, like 10 times wider, where we're going to have access to molecules like CO2, carbon monoxide, methane, all of those contain carbon, in addition to water and, and of course, Rare, more rare molecules like the ones that, that uh, Ravi is talking about and others. So, so now we'll really be able to get at the details of the atmosphere, what's happening. So for example, 
Um, we have this class of planets called super Earths or sub-Neptunes. They're intermediate between the terrestrials and the giants in our solar system. We don't have one in our solar system as far as we can tell, maybe way out at planet nine, I don't know. Um, but they're very common in the galaxy. It's like the most common type of planet right now, at least that we know of. So we don't understand their nature. What we know is that planet formation and evolution is this dynamic process. There's a lot of interaction with the parent star. There are gravitational interactions between the planets and the disk that cause planets to move around. So it's really hard to sort all of that out and understand the nature of a planet when there's so many things going on. So when we measure these molecules, we will take their ratios, like for example, the ratio of water to methane. That ratio is one value when you're looking at planets like Neptune and is pretty constant for, for the giant planets that have large hydrogen envelopes, what we call primordial envelopes. But it's completely different when you're talking about planets that are more terrestrial-like that have secondary outgassed envelopes. So just looking at how that ratio changes from one class of planets to another is already going to be extremely useful in understanding how the environment of the planet is, is shaping its atmosphere and its surface. Um, so those are the kinds of questions that we'll be asking, like what is the transition between primordial atmospheres to secondary outgassed atmospheres? What is the nature of this mysterious population of planets that are in between? And how do these physical processes operate that create this diversity of planets? I'm just trying to imagine that headline when it's like water and methane detected in an atmosphere on TRAPPIST-1E, and I just see the internet like breaking, you know? <laughs> I hope so. I hope that's real. I mean, that's your job is to make that exciting. And I think it's a challenge, you know, because people are going to be like, oh, you detected methane. What does that mean? Right. So it's going to be and it's not like a beautiful picture. So we're going to have to explain that to the public in a, in a way that makes it that the people can understand its import. I mean, there was a paper recently also just to go back to biosignatures um, that, that methane could be a, a reasonable biosignature in a planet like TRAPPIST-1e. Um, we're we're going to be very hard pressed to detect these um, multiple molecules in an atmosphere like TRAPPIST-1e, but, but it, I mean, it's possible. It kind of comes down to a strategic choice about how much time you want to spend observing TRAPPIST-1e? Do we want to get 100 transits and stack and average them to really tease out these signals? Or do we want to observe 300 exoplanets over the lifetime of Webb and really understand the diversity? I mean, with 300 exoplanets, that's like a new lens on diversity that we haven't had before, a new way of looking at demographics. And that could potentially be extremely powerful. So it'll be, it'll be a, a balance, but... Um, the fact that Webb is now expected to last more than 10 years because we have more fuel uh, left over from the commissioning period than we thought, uh, that's extremely good news and really changes our thinking about what those strategies might be. I want to emphasize Natalie's point on the super Earth and uh, the mini Neptunes. We don't have those kind of planets in our solar system. So Webb is going to give us data on something to totally new that we are not you know, exquisite data on something we don't have. It's like we found our lo long last uncle and then we know more about, you know, we have now new instrument to know more about them. So this is super exciting actually. Uh, one other piece that we can add there is the, these measurements, this, this, you know, huge number of exoplanets that will be observed. We'll get these tantalizing hints of what the atmosphere is like, particularly like the upper atmosphere and that's you know, a lot of what we work on is building models right now, trying to understand sort of what you were asking, you know, how does what you measure in the top of the atmosphere determine what's happening at the surface? And a lot of that's based on what we know about the Earth, which means we sort of have one planet that's, that's the ground truth for all these models. And now we have this chance to test that against all these other planets. And so it'll be this feedback between what do we observe on these planets? It surely won't match the models that we have right now, but we can hopefully understand why as we observe more and more planets. And then build these models up that will help us relate these, these measurements from web to what's actually going on at the surface and maybe say something meaningful about whether that is life in fact, or if we can come up with these you know, fancy surface processes that could produce similar features. And that's something that'll be really exciting to see, but we'll probably take hopefully not too long, but I imagine you know, months, maybe even a few years after the initial results come in. 
you're kind of anticipating. I just wanted to follow up and then I'll open the floor. Sorry, I'm, I'm hogging this all a bit, but um, having you, you guys available is just too great an opportunity. Um, but that notion of Earth-like, right? Looking for an Earth-like world. Um, oh, and it's kind of in your blurb here. That's, that, that's what you study. What does Earth-like mean to you? Um, everybody fusses at us when we use that word in stories because we normally don't have context for it. So could each of you talk about what Earth-like means to you and doesn't mean? I guess I'll, I'll jump in first then. Uh, for me, I definitely use it loosely, which is probably not great. Sometimes I mean Earth-like to mean exactly like the modern Earth. Though usually, I mean, you know, as a, a planet that is rocky with surface oceans and typically exposed continents, so not so much water that you've submerged all your continents, which can alter the sort of processes that could happen on the planetary surface. So generally, when I say Earth-like, I mean an atmosphere, liquid water on the surface, and exposed rocky continents. Uh, and typically, yeah, usually we're thinking habitable as well. So it's you know, in the habitable zone of the star, and it's not frozen. Right. So Earth-like, uh, if we are look, looking for Earth-like biosignatures, and the, the question comes out, which Earth are we talking about? Are we talking about the current Earth? Are we talking about Earth a few billion years ago? Because there was life at that time too, right? Uh, and so that there were there were different gases uh, in two two three billion years ago. There was no oxygen uh, two point seven billion years ago on Earth. And so when we when we are looking for these kind of biosignature gases, we are looking for Earth through time on uh, on on some of these uh, or some of these exoplanets. We want to look for what kind of uh, gas mixtures can we look together. Uh, uh, so that we can, you know, at least get to a reasonable conclusion that what kind of habitable conditions the planet that the planet could have. I don't really use the word Earth-like. Um, I try to avoid it. Um, I talk a lot about temperate terrestrial-sized planets. Temperate meaning you know, not too hot, not too cold, which, which just indicates a range of orbits. It doesn't actually speak to the surface temperature. Um, and terrestrial size to me is like less than 1.5 times the radius of Earth and less than 10 Earth masses. That seems to be a pretty safe range of what would constitute more or less an Earth-like planet. I mean, the problem is that some of these small planets could actually uh, be the remnants of stripped Neptunes, like the core, the remnant core of a planet that has, used to have a very thick hydrogen envelope that's been stripped. Um, there's even growing evidence that there could be another class of planets, these ice worlds or water worlds with 50% rock and 50% H2O. Uh, that evidence is newly emerging. Uh, it's been dismissed in the past, but I don't know, it's becoming more and more compelling as we collect and measure more masses of planets that have been discovered by TESS. So that's really interesting. So it means that, that even the planets that are small, some fraction of them could have this sordid history that maybe is not amenable to life evolving on its surface. So that's, that's why we need to understand all these physical processes so that we can have a good handle on what fraction of the small temperate terrestrial sized planets um, formed really like Earth and which ones had a completely different formation pathway that could result in a very different environment. Thank you all. I have to deal with the house crisis at the moment. I'm going to leave the otter running um, and just step away for a moment. Thank you all. These are the great questions, Alex. Rich. Rick, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You're right. Says Richard on there. There's, there's a rich as well. <laughs> single, right. I have to change it for every single Zoom meeting, and I never remember to. Um, anyway, I want to return to techno signatures. Uh, you can guess what my assignment is. Um, and, uh, um, uh, what things other than chemicals in the atmosphere could be detected? Could could um, uh, with existing or not or semi near future instruments? I'm thinking things like night lights or even heat islands from cities. If if alien worlds have cities um, um, or, or, or something more exotic. Uh, so the, those, are, those are the right ones. Uh, uh, Lisa, if you can pull up the second slide of my presentation, I just want, there was a slide I presented in my talk yesterday, just to give a, uh, a, a, an incomplete overview of what kind of techno signatures that one might look for 
Um, you are right, Rich, that they, you know one of the techno signatures that we can look are for city uh, city lights, um, and we also uh, the heat islands. If we if we have the capability to take, detect them in the infrared, oh, um, one slide prior, I think, slide two, oh, not that. Oh, okay. So maybe at the end, I I maybe in the backup slides I have it. Um, so there are um, a couple of them. Uh, some of them are ongoing, actually. Uh, even more, even more, even more, even more, even more. If you keep going, da, 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 da. see, it is what happens when you make too many slides. Um, so there, uh, there are. Um, uh, da, 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 da. It's not there. Oh, there you go. Um, so there are a couple of them that we could do. Uh, one is the surface structures, uh, we essentially the city lights and the heat islands that you're talking about, Rick. Uh, they, there was a paper uh, recently by Thomas Beattie who uh, men, uh, calculated uh, um, uh, you know, how likely we would be able to detect city lights on an exoplanet if, it ex if they exist uh, with uh, you know, future telescopes. Uh, there are... Um, Laser pulses, uh, techno signatures. You know, if we want, if they want to communicate, or they don't need to communicate, uh, if they just are using laser pulses for whatever reason. Uh, there is a possibility to do that. Shelley Wright uh, from UCSD, uh, who won the Frank Drake Award recently, uh, she has a program uh, on this uh, laser city, infrared uh, city, uh, that she's been working on. Uh, you all know about the radio city, of course. Uh, it's been going on for the past several decades now, uh, and um, you know, there are the 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 idea now is uh, coming. Uh, everyone th are thinking about is that with the upcoming and future telescopes, what kind of techno signatures we would be able to detect? So air pollution is one thing, city lights are another thing, heat islands are another one, uh, laser pulses are uh, you know another techno signatures. Some of these techno signatures, they don't even have to do anything. They just go on about their daily lives. And we will just be using our own um, uh, instruments and tech, uh, methodologies to detect uh, some of the signs of these uh, signatures, just like we do with the biosignatures, right? Uh, same thing we can do with the existing instruments or future instruments. Are we are is there I, I see mega structures and probes on there um are, are uh, i mean i know about dyson spheres and things like that what what could we uh, i can how could we see a satellite or, uh, or, so, oh go ahead no no go ahead please finish your question I no i was gonna say are we talking about them coming to us which would be an entirely different well we we are doing it already right so we are sending probes to uh, you know voyager probe has crossed uh, probes have crossed the uh, the solar system boundaries right pioneer uh, probes have gone already so um, and there is a you know there is there are some um, independent private uh, institutions uh, like break breakthrough starshot are thinking to see how they can uh, develop a technology to send to near a star system that's whether, uh, you know, how long will they take is a different question, but that's at least people are thinking about. So if we can do this and think about this at this time, uh, there might be, uh, you know, the other civilizations, if they exist, maybe also are maybe uh, thinking to do this. And so um, if, if we want to detect such kind of um, artifacts, I would say, uh, you know, probes, um, some there were papers back in the 1980s and the 1990s to find detection limits of uh, uh, identifying such um, uh, probes with uh, using radar within the solar uh, within the Earth neighborhood and the lunar neighborhood. Uh, and and I, I can't remember exactly what their limits were, but uh, you know they, they there was a study that was done to say hey you know if we want to do this, this is how we need to do it. If I can ask one follow-up question on that, um, it, it strikes me that we suddenly are bumping into the Fermi paradox. Um, Fermi's, we, yeah. yeah. Right, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to, uh, go ahead. No, no, Fermi's paradox is neither Fermi's nor a paradox, actually, uh, really, because um, uh, it, was, it was an argument that was uh, started with someone else uh, the paradox is, uh, it's, it's like saying, okay, here is an analogy. We, 
if I go to, I'm in Atlanta now, and if I go to a bus stop and wait for two seconds there and come back and, you know, tell Liza that, hey, I waited for two seconds and I haven't seen a single bus in this town. So there are no buses there in this town at all. This town doesn't have. Them. So the idea here is that we need to do different kinds of searches, different wait longer or do this kind of searches longer time to. And it also assumes that we know what we are looking for. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, something we, how can you find, you know, recognize something that's so beyond uh, or, you know, identify something that you are thinking, uh, uh, have an idea about, and you're looking for only for that. So what we want to do is an anomaly detection rather than uh, just looking for the things that we all know. So the Fermi paradox here is, uh, I, I say that it's, we, uh, at least in the, uh, in the near term, if as, as we expand the search space in different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, we try to identify the things that we can think about for life, uh, to find life on other planets. But we also have to keep our eyes open for any anomalies that we cannot explain, but should not jump to conclusions that that means, oh yeah, we found something you know, aliens or something. We should be careful and just identify it as an anomaly that cannot be explained. Thank you. Yeah, Robbie, I'm actually... Go ahead, go ahead. I, I, was, I was curious, uh, for the, the techno signatures, do you have an idea of how Louvoir or HabX or you know, the next instrument, how that will, uh, will make possible new detections or, or other yes. possibilities? Yes, uh, so Liza, if you can bring up the presentation again, sorry. <laughs> uh, there's a plot in there where we, uh, where we published a, a paper last year about how nitrogen dioxide could be detected with, uh, uh, with uh, a LUAR, the big LUAR telescope at that time, the 15 meter class telescope. Now Decadal has made its recommendation. And so this is kind of uh, a bit uh, outdated uh, it's from last six, seven months. Uh, if you go back a little bit more in, in uh, even more, even more, uh, even more, even more, uh, even more, even more, even more, more before. Yeah, there. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this one. So this is um, uh, where, uh, what's on the, the x axis here is the amount of time in hours you need with the LUAR 15 meter class telescope. Uh, and if you keep Earth at 10 parsecs, it's about 30 light, 32 light years away. And uh, uh, and the y-axis here is uh, the amount of signal to noise ratio you would get uh, to detect this nitrogen dioxide on Earth-like planet, uh, which is uh, kept at 10, uh, 30 light years away, right? And the x-axis is the amount of observation time you would need in hours. And you can see that uh, to reach a decent level of uh, signal to noise ratio of five there, uh, you would need about 600 hours of uh, LUAR 15 meter class telescope, okay? Uh, and that's only for uh, uh, present Earth level. However, if you go to the next slide, Liza, our Earth, uh, on the Earth, uh, the nitrogen dioxide concentrations have reduced. We obviously have uh, reduced our pollution, which is great for us, right? So, uh, but at the 40 years ago, there were three times uh, more. Uh, uh, on Earth. So if you want to look for an Earth uh, 40 years ago at 10, uh, 30 light years away from us, uh, you would probably need even, you know, a little less than 600 hours, not so much, but it's about that. And so this is with the lower 15 meter class telescope. Does that address your question, Avan? Oh yeah, no, yeah. I was, I'm just curious. You know, I haven't thought as much about techno signatures with Louvoir. I'm just curious what's coming in 20 years from now. Right. There's, there's a there's a chapter on that actually. We wrote about what could be possible techno signatures that we could detect with Louvoir in the Louvoir report, final report. Cool. Thanks. We actually had a question from Alec Jha, who couldn't be here, but he was asking a very similar question to what Owen was asking: was what, is, what are the instruments? What are the missions that are coming up that are going to ex and your capacity to look for biosignatures and technosignatures and other important features on exoplanets. Um, and how can, how will that push you forward? Is there a way you can describe, you know, the improvement? And I think we talked a little about technosignatures. So Owen, could you talk a little bit about biosignatures? Uh, sure, yeah, for biosignatures, definitely looking forward to something like Louvoir, which 
uh, it, hopefully you, you've heard at least a mention of it before, but it'll be the next generation telescope that will, will fingers crossed, be you know, maybe six meters, maybe if we, if we can push it in the study, maybe even eight, who knows? I don't know how firm that is at the moment, but a large space-based telescope. And what I'm most excited about is that it should enable direct imaging of Earth-like planets in the habitable zone around sun-like stars. And that's something that we'll probably have to wait until that time to get. Uh, I don't think James Webb will have that ability. I think the, the angular separation is too small, but I'm sure Natalie can, can weigh in on, on that. So really we'll be looking two decades out for that. And that means we can start looking for signs of, of vegetation on the surface. Right? We might have a chance to look for that reflectance, uh, just like on Earth, right? We see the planet, we see these green plants. The, the strongest reflectance is actually just beyond that in the infrared, which is why we call it the red edge. Uh, you know, I have a slide on that, but I think we can picture it. We just can't see it. Infrared at red edge, what we're going to look for. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. I'm sure there's surface techno signatures that you could probably look for as well once you have this direct imaging capability. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure you know, what that would be entirely because I haven't thought too much about techno signatures on the surface, but it's definitely what I'm, I'm excited about for biosignatures relating the surface to the atmosphere and having both those observations at the same time will make a huge difference. Any more questions from our reporters in the audience? I see Linda's on. Do you have any questions, Linda? Linda Billings? I do not, thank you. I'm just listening in and it's wonderful to listen. Thank you so much. You're welcome. One question I would like to hear about is what you consider to be um, the kind of evidence that would be convincing of that you have found evidence of life. What are the caveats? What are the things that you would feel would be, I don't know, a smoking gun has already been mentioned as perhaps not possible, but is it is it different types of evidence coming together? Is there specific signatures that you're looking for that you think would be particularly unique and could not be produced by non-biological means? I, I personally think it's going to be very difficult to state conclusively that a planet is a living world if it's just one planet. What I'd like to see happen with this large space-based mission that comes after, after JWST, after WFIRST, or Roman, the Roman Space Telescope, um, I, I would like it to be able to observe enough planets that we get more of a statistical sample. Uh, my hope is that the living worlds kind of stick out like a sore thumb when you look at them statistically over, over a broad swath of planet types. Um, but one thing that we've learned from our theorists like, like Ravi and Owen is that in order to really interpret the spectroscopic signatures that we see, we have to understand a lot about the planet. We have to understand what kind of star it's orbiting, what its evolutionary history was, um, evolutionary history in terms of how the star changed as it aged, but, but also how the planet interacted with its, its disk, how it got to be where it is in its current configuration. All of those kinds of factors are going to be important in understanding the propensity for life or how to interpret those signatures. So, you know, our, our theorists are so important right now because we don't have any observational data to work with. So, but by doing models and thinking about all the possible scenarios, I think that that will help us to really fine tune our search in, in the future and understand the data a little bit better and what the possible false positive scenarios are that could confound us. Just to add a little bit to that, the uh, the models, of course, when we we tune them with basically you know, with, with data that we have, and often with imagination on what we can picture being realistic, and we can sometimes get really creative. So any biosignature that you can think of, you can come up with you know, an abiotic way of producing that, right? Some just geologic process or or other formation process, and probably get the same thing in your simulations. And so I really like the uh, the approach that that Natalie mentioned. It's this statistical approach where any one planet is probably, it's gonna to be tough to say conclusively, yes, we found life. Uh, unless, you know, if you got every biosignature you could imagine all pinging positive, maybe. Uh, that seems unlikely, right? We'll probably get a couple of, of promising biosignatures and then things that confuse us as well. So it's really gonna be this, this ability to bring together a vast amount of data and leverage the advances in computing that we have to really build up this confidence that yes, we're detecting something like life. 
Uh, and that's, that's something that I think is going to be really exciting in the next 20 years. This morning, we had another panel with a, a lot of biologists who were talking about what we know about life, what we knew about Earth's past, but also we don't know what the constraints are in life. We, maybe we don't know what we're looking for, in other words. What if life does not look, and in the universe does not look like life on Earth? How do we know what we're looking for? Do you have ways to approach that question when you're looking for signatures of life in the universe if you're maybe not looking for something that is exactly the same as life is here on Earth? Our one example of life. I, Robbie and Owen can speak about this much more eloquently than than I can, but but I'm not that actually that worried about it. Um, our myopic, you know, Earth example, one single example of life approach. Um, I, I think you know we're looking at the atmospheric signatures of of. I mean, whatever's there, it could be technosignature, it could be a biosignature, the line between them is blurred. Biosignatures we think of as metabolic byproducts. All life, what we know is that all life harnesses energy to do work. That's how it maintains itself. Um, we humans harness a lot of energy to do work in, in interesting ways that go beyond just sustaining our bodies. And it creates complexity and it puts pollutants out into the air. Um, so, so all of these processes, be they metabolic or due to technology or even communication, they operate on a completely different time scale than geological processes. So it, it means that you have some kind of disequilibrium happening. You have, you have to have like this constant source of, of pollutants, be they biosignatures or technosignatures, um, in order to maintain the levels that are observed. So, so if you look at a statistical sample of exoplanets and you notice molecules in certain combinations that shouldn't exist unless you had that constant feed, you know something interesting is going on no matter what the, the nature of the life is. It'll be up to us to interpret it and to, to understand why that's happening. And that'll be a tall order because there could be things operating on short time scales, I suppose. So we have to really do due diligence to weed out the interpretation or really understand if it's a living world. But but I, I think it'll be readily apparent. It's, uh, if we want to, there is a reason why we are trying to look uh, right now, you know, Earth similar life. Uh, you know, here is an example. If you are called, called to a party that you don't know well, and you go to the party, what is the first thing you would do? You'd go to someone you would recognize, right? To start up a conversation. And then you start going and look for others who you do not know. That's essentially what we are trying to do. We have been invited to a party because we found a lot of parties happening on different worlds now, right? So we are trying to see uh, if uh, we can identify someone we know. And the someone we know is how we look like. So that's what we are trying to find first. And as Natalie pointed out, then uh, we will try to find what kind of uh, processes are happening there. And there are certain things that life can do in terms of how it uses energy. And, and if we see those kind of signs uh, on some of these planets, then that is an indication that, it's, as Natalie said, something interesting is going on. There may be a party going on. So let's get invited there. There's also just a limited number of molecules, right? I mean, look, look at the universe. What is the universe? What is the universe made out of? Uh, and when, when you look at that inventory of, of nucleosynthetic products that are created in the Big Bang and due to stars, you, you get these abundances where carbon is very common, nitrogen, oxygen. I mean, the very elements that life is made out of. So, um, you know, oxygen, we look for oxygen, that's a metabolic byproduct of certain types of life um, on planet Earth, but oxygen is also a very special element in the way that it's configured, the way that its valence electrons are organized and how reactive it is. Um, water is very special. I mean, these are just building blocks that are there out in the universe. And so we'll be looking for all of those molecules and trying to understand the chemistry of what's going on on the surface and in the atmosphere.
I think that's a wonderful place to stop. Unless there are any final questions from reporters, we've reached the end of our time. I want to give a big thanks to our panelists for being here and answering our questions today. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can reach us at news at agu.org. And thank you for coming. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.